Anyway, so in the last lecture, we were talking about uh, population. We started into this discussion. And also, we're going to be talking a little, a little bit later about something a little bit related to this, moving and copying, something called implicit moving. It's sometimes referred to. Uh, so I just want to start by going through an example in a little bit more detail of uh, pass by value in a situation where copy illusion is, happens. And the particular example I want to consider is just this very simple code example at the top of the slide. Again, capital T just denotes some default constructible type. It has to be default constructible. Otherwise, for example, this expression T paren paren is not going to be valid because you can't default construct T. Uh, but otherwise, it's perfectly general. It doesn't really matter what T is. So what we're doing in this case is we're, we're passing arguments to functions. So in particular, the caller is going to be invoking this function call E up above, and it's going to be passing at a default constructed T. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, for, go first of all, go through like what would happen if there was no population at all, um, which I, we'd actually violate the standard, I believe, in this case, and then go through what happens when there's copulation. Because in this case, copulation actually is required, so this is why it would violate the standard. Um, so if we just bring up this, and by the way, these PDFs that I keep going over to in, in the lectures, these are also all on the course website, so you can download them. They're not some kind of thing that you have to go back and look at the lecture videos necessarily to see. So in the situation, if there's no copulation, what we would have happening is in the caller. So if I go back and look kind of quickly at the code here, um, when the caller goes to call the callee, the very first thing it's going to have to do is generate the argument that's going to be passed to the function. So it actually needs to create this default constructed T. And in the absence of copulation, what would happen is it would create a local variable in the caller um, that holds a default constructed T. And then because the, 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 the function that you're calling doesn't see that, that local variable, what you have to do is you have to propagate the value of that local variable into the actual formal parameter of that function, which is a local variable. So you would have to get that uh, local variable in the caller, which is holding this temporary object, this default constructed T, and then you'd have to propagate it into P, the actual local variable of the caller. And these are distinct things. Um, so we would have something like what's uh, shown here. So, we would first create some temporary object in the caller with a default constructed T in it, and then we would have to either move or copy to propagate the value into the, the parameter, the formal parameter P of the function call E. Well, it's, it's not too bad, I guess. We have like one copy or move happening. Uh, but in the absence or in the presence of copy elision, which is actually required in this case, what happens is we just default, the, the caller will directly default construct the T into the formal parameter of the function. Like it, and, and this might seem like this, if you're not, well, I think, I'm sure some of you had courses on compilers, maybe computer science people. Um, but for those of you who haven't, are not really sure how like languages are implemented and so on, this is not like an overly burdensome thing to do. It's actually fairly easy for the compiler to just directly put things into the, the local variable of the function being called. Because all of the parameters are passed on the stack, so the, the, and the local variables also the caller on the stack. It just looks a little bit further along the stack, puts the data there, and then just calls the function. So if, if you're thinking that the compiler writers have to do a lot of stuff to make this work, this is actually one of the easier things. There's lots of other things that are pretty horrible, but this is not one of them. Anyway. And, and notice here, like not only are we eliminating, like going from the top scenario to the bottom one here, not only are we eliminating a, a copy or move, we're also eliminating the need for a temporary object. So there's no construction and destruction of that temporary object. It's not strictly just the copying and moving we're getting rid of. Often we're getting rid of temporaries and then they don't have to be created and destroyed and that saves us constructor and destructor calls. Oops. Yeah, and the next few slides. Uh, some of these slides are just kind of going through and looking at things from a slightly different perspective what I'm describing. They might be helpful to look through on your own, but um, I'm going to skip. And the ones on uh, exceptions, like catching by value, throwing by value, I'm going to ignore those. Just in terms of priorities, they're lesser, of lesser importance in terms of this course. Um, what I want to talk about next, though, is copulation in the context of initialization. And this actually, I guess, kind of came up indirectly in some other questions that were asked in the last lecture, but we hadn't quite gotten here yet. Um, so another context in which uh, copulation can happen is when you're initializing variables. So uh, here we have the, the same class that we've been using as kind of a running example throughout. We have this widget class. It has a copy constructor and a move constructor. So moves are implemented, copies are implemented. So we can use either one. They're available to us. Um, and then we have this function uh, called func, which returns a widget. It's returning by value. We don't actually know the implementation of it. So because of this, when we're going through the example, there's some things that we can't quite say with certainty. There's kind of like multiple situations that can arise. Uh, because we don't know the body of this function, we don't know whether the uh, like 
because this function is returning by value somewhere inside the code for func, it's going to generate some kind of widget object, which probably is going to be a local variable of that function, and then it has to propagate that value out. Um, but depending on how the code is written, it may be that that copy is required to be elided, or maybe it's not required. But we can't tell without seeing the actual code for the function. So if we're, at, if we're trying to be really thorough in analysis, we have to say, well, if the function func is written in a way that that copy is elided, we get one kind of behavior. In the, in the case that it, it, in the other case, we get a different kind of behavior. Uh, so if we look at these uh, uses or in, invocations of the function func and, and use you know, basically just some different initializations in the main function below, uh, I just want to kind of walk through them and explain like what's going on with, with respect to copy elision. So if you look at this first line here, line 12, um, in this particular case, copy elision is actually required. Okay, so maybe if I back up to the top of the slide here, I should probably comment on what the rule says. So if you're initializing an object and the initializer is a PR, PR value, in other words, what we call a pure R value. Again, this is the reason why it's because of copy elision that we care about splitting hairs. Like there's R values. If we only care about moving versus copying, like all we really care about is, is something an R value or an L value. But in the case where we're dealing with copy elision, we have to split hairs further and say, is something a pure R value? Because when pure R values are involved, this is typically the situations where uh, copy elision is mandatory. It has to be done. And this is also the case here. So if you're initializing an object and the initializer, the thing you're initializing from, is a pure R value expression, the, init the initialization can't incur any copying. Like the copy must be elided. Um, so that's kind of the, the rule of the game here. So if we come down with that in mind here and look at the line of code that we have here, we have this function func, which is returning a widget. So what's gonna happen is we, and I have some uh, diagrams to help illustrate this. And uh, yeah, they're actually on the course website, but they're not in a zip file. I, I think I put them there this morning. Um, so these are new uh, figures that weren't in the zip file that you downloaded before, if you've downloaded it, uh, but they are on the course website. So. If I open this uh, document up here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through for, for that particular line in main that we were just looking at a moment ago. I'm going to talk about first what would happen if there was no copy elision, um, but it's required by the standard in this case. So this would be violating the standard, but it's still nevertheless a helpful exercise to say like what would happen if there was no copy elision. Um, so in this case, what would happen if there's no copy elision at all? Then when func is called, because func is returning a widget, if you, if you look at the slide, uh, basically it's returning by value a, a widget object. Uh, because of this, it's gonna have to have some widget object that it can return. So assuming that it's, it's storing it in some local variable within func, um, it's either gonna be a temporary object or some object that's actually explicitly created depending on how the code is written. But one way or another, you're gonna have an object of type widget, which holds the um, value that's being returned. I'll go back to the code here and, the, and, and basic whatever you know this is going to create some widget object, object internally and then return it back we don't know exactly what it's returning but it, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this discussion um, and then once we have that before func returns you would have to save you know propagate the value of this this uh, local variable into some temporary object in the caller so that when when func returns and this object here is destroyed we still have a have some value that we can look at in the caller to know what was returned uh, so we have this uh, propagation from the from the called function into the caller. Um, then there's going to be another propagation of values happening here because we take the return value of this function, which would be in that temporary we're just looking at, and then we're using it to, to construct an, a temporary object. It's a temporary object because you have like widget bracket, some something, end bracket. Um, this is going to correspond to a temporary. So it's going to construct a temporary by either copying or moving from func. Um, so this is what the... Uh, uh, this object here corresponds to and then finally we're going to propagate that value into x which was basically correspond or sorry into w Did i label it as x oh, okay that should be a w i guess to match the code which are, basically that gets propagated into w which i've labeled as x in the diagram and so but this is not what the the standard requires the standard actually requires that there's no uh copying at all happening here. It's just, except for maybe propagating the value out of func. Um, so the other two scenarios that I have drawn on this, uh, this uh, separate handout here, I'll consider now like what happens with copy elision, but there's two possible cases that can arise because we don't know what the body of the function func looks like. So we can't actually say whether or not copy elision is required for propagating the value out of func into the caller. And depending on how, whether that's elided or not, there's kind of one or two cases that can arise. So in the case where, um, 
what's the first one I have here? I guess this is the case where the, the copy is elided. So in other words, the, the value that's being returned from Funk can directly be constructed in some place in the caller. In the case that that happens, we just directly construct into W. And actually, this time, I, did, I don't know why. The top diagram was labeled as an X, but somehow I consistently label things W correctly later. So I don't know what happened there. <laughs> anyway, at least it's mostly correct, the diagram. Um, yeah. Anyway, so like this is a big savings, right, over what's above here. Like we, we saved, we're propagating a value once, twice, three times. So you have like three copy slash moves happening. Also, we have two temporary, or actually, I guess, well, two temporary objects and then kind of one additional object, which might be a temporary, or maybe it's just like a named object within the function, depending on how funk is written. Again, we don't know how funk is written in this example. So there's some things we can't say with certainty. Uh, but at least you have some object here, whether it's a temporary or not. So we eliminate basically three variables, two temporaries at least, and save a bunch of copies and moves. Um, the other possibility is maybe funk is written in such a way that uh, copy elision is either not required or, well, it's not required or, you know, it's not required in, in the compiler, I guess, chooses not to do it. Or maybe it can't be done for some reason. Um, then, then in this case, what we end up with, we just have a single copy or move. Essentially, the if the, the value from the function funk can't be propagated, can't be elided, the copy of, you see this, yeah. You have the, like the return value sitting in the caller and you have to propagate it out to the, right, in the call key and you have to propagate it out to the caller. I need to slow down. Sometimes when I speak too fast, I even get ahead of myself. Um, and this propagation of, of values could be elided or not. And this is the thing we can't tell because we don't know the definition of funk. So we can't really tell for certain whether or not it's, it's required that this copy be elided. But if it's not elided, then what happens is, is the return value is actually going to be sitting in maybe a temporary object or some name variable inside of the function funk, and then it's going to get propagated in directly into W, so directly into the, the uh, place where we want to put it in the caller uh, without any temporary. But we still have this extra copy or move here, and we also have to actually create this variable within funk. Uh, so there's a little bit more cost, but it's still a savings compared to what we have up above here, if there's absolutely no copy elision happening at all. Anyway, any questions? Yeah. I apologize, sometimes I start keep talking too fast and then I even get too fast for myself and then I can't even say anything intelligible. Anyway, so that's the, the first line that we, I guess I'm just, I'm just too, this gets me too excited, this stuff, and sometimes I just get too excited. And I, wow, C++, and then I, I, I talk too fast through what my brain can handle. Um, so the other other example I want to look at is the next. There's only basically two lines of code inside this function. So the other one I want to look briefly at is just this one here. So we're, this doesn't involve funk at all. So this is a little bit easier to analyze. We have a widget called U, and we're trying to construct it by by a, a default constructed widget object. We're trying to initialize it from a default constructed widget object. And and by the by the way, I think that this case, uh, if like. So there's lots of ways you can initialize things. Here you can notice I put the parameters for the constructor in brace brackets. I think in this case, though, if you use round brackets, then you went, run into the so-called uh, vexing parse issue. I think it will not parse this as a, parse it as like a function declaration or something instead. Uh, so you need to sometimes be careful about that sort of stuff. Um, anyway, but, so anyway, there's, there's some, I think, logic behind why I'm a little bit inconsistent here using brace brackets because I think it's necessary. Anyway, but that's, you can just ignore any, all of what I just said if you want. It doesn't really affect this example too much. The main thing is that we have a, a default constructed widget that we're using to initialize U. So in the absence of copy elision, what this would do is it would like create a temporary object, uh, a widget, like a local variable of a caller, and then you would basically propagate that by probably what would be a move, a copy or move, a move if it was available into U. But in this particular case, because the expression here that's being used to initialize you is a pure R value expression. And again, pure R value expressions, essentially they're like placeholders for temporary objects. I, I, I try to avoid saying temporary objects because pure R value expressions might not cause a temporary object to be created. Um, that's kind of the, the part of the point of them. Um, so it's maybe better to call them a placeholder. But when you, when you see them, you start to get used to the pattern. It's something that maybe could cause a temporary object to be created. That's essentially what a pure R value is. At least when we're talking about pure R values that correspond to, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to put it. I'll just stop there. Um, yeah, so what's going to happen in the, in the case of copy elision is that because this is required, you're going to directly default construct this uh, widget object into you. So the, the only thing happens is just a single default constructor call and you're done. There's no copy moving, there's no temporary objects, it's just you put it where you want. 
and, and I do have a, a diagram to go with that, but it's probably not very exciting. It just looks like this. You just directly put the object into the place where you want when you pop with copulation. I hit the wrong key there. Oh, maybe just pause for a second. Any questions about this before I move on? Okay. The initialization is quite important too. This is why I wanted to talk about initialization because um, obviously you do a lot of things where you're initializing things. And if you're using pure RVI expressions, you can be assured that there's not going to be a copy happening associated with that. Mm -hmm. Actually, the example of that before with the digital switch front, uh, what was the first where did that come from? In, in, in your diagram. Okay, you're asking about the diagram. Let me go back. So this was for the 1A one, right? This one here. Yes. So you're talking about the top part, I think. Yeah, the right here. temp object. This one? Yeah, what, what was the, the reasoning for that again? Okay, well, the, the, the part there is like a little bit fuzzy in the sense that we're not really, we can't really say categorically what's going on, but basically we have, we're making some reasonable assumptions about what's going on inside Funk, like in the body of Funk, but we don't know what the body of Funk is because we only have the declaration and not the definition. But it, it's, it's probably reasonable to assume that one of two things happen. Either it creates some local variable like a widget w and does eventually assigns a value to w and then does return w. Or alternatively, maybe it does something like return and then some pure r value expression, which is a widget. And it returns like a temporary object, which is a widget, or a temporary object expression, which is a widget. Um, but either way, if there's no copulation happening, then there's going to be something in the, let me just go back to the diagram here. There's gonna be something in the caller which is holding the value to be returned. What we can't really say here is, is, is this thing actually a temporary object that is used by the compiler? It would be if it was something like return widget bracket bracket. And then the compiler would create a temporary object that's local to the function that holds that object, and then that would get propagated out by a copy or loop when the, before the function returns, assuming there's no population. Um, or alternatively, maybe you have code in the inside funk which looks something like widget w, and then in its default constructed maybe return w. In this case, this wouldn't actually be a temporary object. It would instead be like a local variable. But it doesn't really change the picture. The only thing that would change is that whether it's correct to label this as a temporary object from the compiler, or whether it's actually a variable that the, the programmer wrote explicitly in the function funk itself. But one way or another, you're going to be like propagating the value. Like I'm assuming you're not doing anything weird like it's actually returning like a static, like a static widget or something, like something that's not a local variable and you're returning that. So I'm assuming it's not anything weird like that happening. Um, I guess in principle it could, but it's the, the kind of cases where that would arise are, are like percentage wise much, much more rare, I would say. Did that answer your question at least? Uh, yeah, and then so well, then what's the difference? So there's that return value temp object, potentially temp object, and then there's the other return value Okay, I, I, I'm trying to, like, I, I couldn't come up with, well, these are my way of distinguishing things in my head. If you have better suggestions for terminology, I'm open to them. But this is the return value. This is the returned value. Like, because they're not the same thing. The return value, what I'm calling the return value is the thing sitting inside the called function before it gets propagated out. It's the thing that you're about to return, like the thing in the return expression. Then separate from that is the thing in the caller that actually holds the value that's been returned. I don't know if this is standard kind of terminology, but at least to me it sort of makes sense. This is like the value to be returned, and then this is the value that's actually returned and, and is sitting in the caller. So that's what's meant by that. I hope I, I, my intention was to try to use this terminology kind of consistently on the examples, but I, I guess I never did really quite explain the, the, the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. I just use the same terminology to return values. Do those just never exist for constructors? Like I noticed in the following B example, it follows this one, there was no local. Do you, do you mean by follows? You mean this one down here? Like you, no, no. Oh, okay. A later example. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe just one clarifying point here. Like this is guaranteed not to happen because this, in, the, in the code that we're looking for, at least not all of what's happening there. Most of what's happening there is guaranteed not to happen. Like most of the stuff over on the left hand side here, because because those things are required to be elided by the compiler. The only thing that we can't really say too much about, because in this example, I sort of deliberately didn't say what funk was, because in some cases when you're writing code, you don't really know, maybe that funk is in a library and you're trying to figure out, well, what's gonna happen? And then you have to say, well, there's like kind of multiple possibilities depending on how that person wrote funk. Um, so that was the reason why I wanted to go through this. But, but just to be clear though, like this, most of the stuff on the left is like, it's not gonna happen. 
Um, but I guess you're saying like, it, but maybe in some cases, what if it did or something like that? In, in a case like if there's northern stuff happening, uh, do constructors still never create a local um, copy of uh, like temporary? Well, I mean, like what would matter is what the particular expression, like, let me go back. Why is this not going back? Oh, here we go. Yeah, so you're, you're basically talking about this line here, right? Yeah, because in, um, in the drawing of that one, there is nothing in the local. And, and, and this would also be like the same story, even if you did something the same, like in one of the examples I had in the other lecture, where you say like widget and then widget, like open bracket, widget, open bracket, widget, open bracket, and string a whole bunch of long and a bunch of closing, 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 closing brackets. Yeah. You would still have exactly the same effect because all of those intermediate temporaries would be required to be aligned. Um, so like if, if the expressions that are involved, like going more directly to your question, if the expressions involved that I want to continue you have this widget bracket bracket, if they're pure R value expressions, they must be lighted out. So as long as you're dealing with pure R value expressions, then what you're describing would be the behavior. Like it just gets rid of everything. Like there's no copying. Um, but um, if, if for example you had expressions where they weren't pure R value expressions, you know, if you were initializing u from another widget, like or put like u w here. So you're initializing this thing from the one up above then there would have to be a copy or move happening at that point. It's, it's because the things that we're using here in the examples, or a lot of the things we're using are pure R value expressions. Any other questions? Okay. Um, yeah, okay, just one quick comment about, um, a copy, further comment about copy elision. So we kind of been focusing primarily on, on copy elision as a way to you know, make your code run faster, like it can make things more efficient. But as I mentioned before, like another side benefit is that it can make some things that would otherwise be impossible to do, possible to do. And in particular, um, things that relate to like types that, for example, aren't movable, aren't copyable. So here I've constructed it like a new widget class, which is different from the ones we were considering before in the sense that this type is not movable, it's not copyable. Um, you can see that basically the, the copy constructors, the sign and, and move constructors, copy assignment operators, move assignment operators are all deleted, meaning that this class doesn't have them. So you can see quite clearly there's no hope that you can copy or move these things. We basically said that it doesn't have these functions. Um, the reason for wanting to say something like equals delete is if you just don't say anything, then for a lot of special member functions that are provided, so it's not a solution necessarily just to not write anything, then you get like defaulted ones. Um, Anyway, but in this particular case, what I have kind of getting back to the main point of what I want to illustrate here, we have this uh, kind of a, what sometimes referred to as a factory function, something that's like making objects of a particular type. So we have a factory function for pumping out widgets. Um, and the interesting thing here, we're returning by value. Um, so in the absence of copy elision, we would have a problem here because if you return by value, fundamentally there's going to be a copy involved in propagating the, or a copy or move involved in propagating the value from the from the called function out to the caller. Um, but because copy elision is, is, copy elision is mandatory in, in certain cases, and in this case it would be mandatory because the thing we're returning here is a pure R value expression. So we're guaranteed that the, like the compiler is required to do copy elision here. So because, copy elision here. So because of this, um, even though in, in the absence of copy elision, this would not be like this code could not compile because you would get a problem that you're trying to copy or move a widget, but the object this class is not copyable or movable. But this works, like it compiles and it's required to compile. Um, and this is the reason why I was saying in an earlier lecture, I think it was probably the last lecture, that it's probably better to think about required or mandatory copy elision as not being an optimization, but rather it's like fundamental in the language. Uh, because if it was an optimization, by virtue of the fact it's an optimization, it means the compiler can go, yeah, I'm going to do it, or no, I'm not. It doesn't have to do it, right? If it's an optimization, the compiler is under no obligation to do it. Um, but if the compiler wasn't un under obligation to do this, to elide this copy, then what you would have a situation where some, for some compilers this code would compile, like the ones that do the, the eliding of the copy. For ones that didn't elide the copy, you get a compiler error saying that there's no move constructor or copy constructor available, and you're trying to move or copy one of these objects. Uh, so this is the sense in which I, I mean that in the case that copy elision is required, it's not. It's better not to think of it as an optimization because if an optimize, if it was an optimization, this would lead to like a lot of problems because then you don't have to do it. It's, when it's required, it, it kind of changes the, the how you want to look at it. So it allows us to do this sort of thing where we can, for example, have as an application, we can have factory functions that return types that are not movable or copyable, just as long as we're careful to make sure that we're returning things in such a way that the copy has to be elided. It's required. And then we're okay, even though the type can't be copied, we know it can't be copied. Like the compiler can't copy it anyway because it has to elide the copy. 
Anyway, so that's what this uh, diagram here, or slide here is about. Um, and I talked about this slide before. It's not really so critical, but. Uh, um, so the last thing I need to talk about in this whole really kind of, this is probably, in my opinion, the most painful part of the course. I think it's the most highly technical. So things get a little bit better beyond this. It's not all downhill from here, uh, hopefully. Um, so the, the last remaining thing I need to talk about, we talked about like moving versus copying. So now we have a handle for when we look at code, we can tell like, is it moving here versus is it copying here? And even better, we can also now tell like, is it even doing anything at all here? Like, is it eliding the copy or not? But the one thing that we're kind of missing here, we don't really quite know the full story with respect to moving versus copying because there's a few kind of, well, at least one, there's one special case rule which is quite important where they make a special rule in the language where normally you would maybe expect things to copy, but they step in and say, you try to move first here in this particular circumstance. And this is essentially the last piece of the puzzle that I need to cover here. Um, this is sometimes referred to as uh, implicit moving. It, it's a move where you don't write std move. It norm like normally, if you look at it and you don't know about the special rule I'm about to introduce, you would look at the code and say it's going to copy, but actually it doesn't. It moves because there's like another implicit rule in the language that says under this particular circumstance, you're allowed to do a move instead of a copy. And so this is what I want to talk about, and it relates to an important thing, which is when you're returning uh, returning things from functions, basically return statements. Um, so if you're returning, if you're returning, if you return statement and a thing that you're returning has automatic storage duration, this is just a fancy way of saying it's a local variable or function. Um, th then the uh, compiler is, is the compiler is allowed to uh, effectively treat the expression that's being returned as if it was an R value expression. So like if you say something like return x, if you don't know about the rule I'm about to talk about, you go well x is a named object. This is an L value. It, it can't be moved. It's not safe. But in the case of a return statement, if you're returning a local variable of the function, they make a special exception in the language saying, treat it first as if it's an R value. In other words, basically what they're saying is, if you can move, move. And then if you can't move, we'll fall back on a copy. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Like this is not gonna be a dangerous thing to do, right? It's important that they make the restriction as a local variable. So it's a local variable, so what does that mean? That means the instant the return statement finishes, it's gone, right? It's destroyed because you just left the, the, the left the function, it's reached the end of its lifetime, it's destroyed. So if I mutilate the value by moving out of it, no one can tell because the variable's gone anyway. Um, so this is the reason why it's effectively safe to do, because like, the variable's about to go away, it's like literally re <laughs> just hanging on for dear life, it's about to be destroyed, and just before it's destroyed, we can move out of it. Um, but they don't say you have to move, because maybe in some circumstance, maybe there is no move constructor provided by the type, so then it falls back on a copy. So more or less, what the, it's a little bit more complicated than what I'm describing, but more or less what it says is first treat the re return expression as an R value expression, even if it's not, and see if there's a, a constructor that you can call, and like a move constructor to move things out of the function, and failing that, you just fall back on trying to do a copy. And of course, if there's no copy either, then basically you have an error, because probably you're trying to either co copy, or, well, you're trying to basically propagate a value out of a type that can't be copied from or moved from. Anyway, so. It's a little bit more, more, more than involved in that if you kind of read the fine print on the slide. But I think this is good enough for our purposes here. Just like if it returns an R, you first treat the expression as if it's an R value to figure out whether you can move or not. If you can't move, then you treat it as whatever it really truly is. And it was a question. So these local variables, they'll get created on the stack first, but then when we move them out, they'll still stay at their location sort of in memory. Does that mean we like stack ends up getting like fragmented with a bunch of these? values that may persist for a long time after they were originally allocated? Um, I, I, I'm not sure, but it sounds like maybe you're talking about like the difference between like which the return, what I'm calling the return value versus the returned value. Like one of them lives in the call, the called function, one of them lives in the caller. Like one is a, the object in the caller that's receiving the return value, but then the return value has to be, is first like created somewhere inside the function that's called. And, and what we're talking what we're talking about here is like because there's some cases where copulation can't happen like either it's not allowed or it is allowed but the compiler is not obligated to do it and it's either it can't for technical reasons or it chooses not to so there's some situations where you do need to either copy or move the value back and this is where this becomes relevant I mean obviously if the copy is being elided then this kind of becomes like really who cares because there's no move or copy to begin with so this becomes kind of a moot point. But in situations where you know you know that either there might not be a, a the, the copy might not be elided, or 
Well, you just basically don't you don't know if it's going to be like because it's not required. Therefore, the compiler may or may not do it, and so on. So then we would be interested in this sort of rule here because then we know a copy or move will happen, and we're trying to figure out because we care about efficiency which one. Um, so there's not like a problem with things kind of get mixed mixed up in the stack. I think maybe you were thinking that there was kind of only one object involved. Then things would probably get kind of mixed up if I was understanding your question. But the they're in different areas of the stack. The returned value would be sitting in the area of the stack that's holding local variables of the calling function. And the value, the thing that I'm calling the return value is basically sitting somewhere in the section of the stack that has the locals for the called function. Mm -hmm. So, and they're in different areas, but there, there are two things. If there was only one thing, then you maybe get into a mess where do you put it? Like, cause it kind of would belong to both functions and then where do you put it? But that's not the, the picture that we have. So when we line the local one, it's actually getting exist in the caller or the call that the call function will be modifying it and then when it's returned it doesn't actually have to be it's already be in the, the SAS space of the original function that called. I think the best way because unless unless you kind of have a bit of a picture in your mind about how it's implemented, it's maybe hard to wrap your mind around how things work because you're kind of asking questions like that are along the lines of like, how is this going to work? Is this going to make a mess of the stack and so on? But the, the way to think of it, and, and off on some architectures, the way it's implemented is that when when a, when you have a function for, for which there's copy moving like this involved, it will pass a hidden pointer, one that's not specified by you in your code, but secretly the compiler adds a pointer. And the way that the function knows where to write the return value to, the, what I'm calling the returned value, the place where the caller needs to, before it, it returns, it needs to make sure that whatever value it's returning gets put into in the caller. The way that this is implemented, at least on some architectures, is there's a hidden parameter that's added to the parameter list of the function, which is set a pointer to where the return value in the caller needs to be put. In other words, it's a pointer to the thing I'm calling the returned variable. So the basic idea is when the compiler is compiling the code for the function that's that's going to, that we're talking about, the one that we're saying, well, does it do copy elision or not when it's propagating its return value out, out of itself. What the compiler is doing, like in the case that it can do copy elision, what happens is the code would look something like, when I figure out what I'm returning, I directly write it to where that pointer points, that hidden parameter. If I can't figure out, like when I'm constructing that object, it's return value and I need to write it into that value, instead I put it in a local variable of the function, and later on I'm going to have to propagate it out by either a copy or move. Um, so, um, again, you're not responsible for how, knowing how things are implemented and so on. This, I mean, some of you may have never even had a course on a compiler before. Um, but it, it may be helpful to have an idea about how this is implemented, because otherwise it, it just gets hard to wrap your mind around, like, how, how is this actually ever going to be able to work? Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit to answer your question. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, so would there ever be a case where uh, you're, like, we think copy list would happen, but it's actually an X value, like where we actually have to care about it being a PR value. Like, I think there would be an example where it's actually an X value and it's kind of a gotcha case. Well, like X value versus pure R value, it doesn't really make a difference with respect to copying and moving, because essentially the decision is made based on is something an L value or an R value. So like R value is like pure R value and X value combined, right? So it doesn't matter if it's an X value or it's a pure R value. Other, either one of them will lead you to the same conclusion with respect to is something copying versus moving. The only place where it becomes important is when you're trying to say, is there even a copy or move in the first place? Like in other words, is copy elision required? Then this is the only place, this is really the only reason why I'm introducing pure R values, I think. I think it's the only thing that you really need to know it for, is if you're trying to say, like copy elision is happening here and I want to know, is it, or, Copy elision is allowed here, and I want to know, is it required to happen here? For this, you need to then say, specifically, it's not good enough, it's just an R value, but it has to specifically be a pure R value. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean, but like, mm -hmm. given, given that case, is there like a reasonable example that where you might, that you might come across where it's actually an X value, um, and the copy elision is not required? because of that, or, or does that basically never happen? Is it, is it well, if it's an X value expression, then it won't be a pure R value expression, because these are mutually exclusive. Like, they're, they're, like if the X values and pure R values are like a, a further subdivision of R values, but they don't overlap. So like something is either, if you have an R value, either it's a pure R value or it's an X value, it has to be exactly one of them. Like it can't be both and it can't be neither. It has to be one or the other. So it either falls into one category or the other. Um, so. 
like what you're describing, like the only thing that really matters is whether something is a pure R value or not with respect to like whether a copy, copying, copy addition is required or not. So if you have something that's an X value, there's no guarantee that population is going to happen in that case because it, or it's not required in that case. But what would be an example of that? That's what I'm asking. What, what would be an example of where you actually do have an X value and like in, in practice, probably the, 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 more, the prototypical example of X values is you're using std move. Like the, re the return value from std move is defined to be a re it return, like the whole only reason it exists is to return an R value reference type. And the reason that it returns an R value reference type, its reason to exist is if you have an R value re function that returns an R value reference type, the result of returning from, the, the re result returned from that function is an X value expression, or more generally it's an R value expression. It's something you can move from safely. So the, the whole reason for using std move is to basically treat something as if it's an R value reference type and then this forces the language to to use a move well if it's available rather than a copy. Um, but this this is not like you, if you have like an X value expression then it, there won't ever be like required copy addition because the rules of the language say only when it's a pure R value is it required. And these things are mutually exclusive, so it can't be an X value and a pure R value at the same time. If it's an X value, it can't be a pure R value. Therefore, copulation can't be required in that case, because it's only required for pure R values expressions. Um, if that doesn't quite clarify, maybe we can take the discussion offline. I mean, this stuff is admittedly quite tricky, but we have to do the best we can sort of to wrap our mind around it. Any other questions? Okay, so. Maybe just to give an example here. So we, we're back to our, our kind of classic widget class from before. So it, it has a move constructor, copy constructor. So the type is movable and copyable. And we have some code that's uh, it's basically returning widgets by value. We have get value underscore one and then get value underscore two here. They both return widgets by value. Um, in the case of this first function here, um, because like what we're returning here, we're W, the expression that's being returned, this is an L value expression, it's a named object, so it's an L value, which means in, in this particular case, copulation is not required. Like it's not a pure R value expression. So we're, we're in the, into the realm of, well, maybe it, cop it's, it, maybe it copies or moves. So then we want to figure out, well, um, is, it, is it going to copy or move? And so if it, if it's uh, the move or copy, well, I mean, the copulation is allowed, it's just that it's not guaranteed to happen. So the more interesting thing from the point of view of the, the particular issue we're discussing here is what happens if copulation doesn't happen because then we have to worry about is it copying or moving and that's sort of the point of this example. Uh, so if the copy or move is not a, is not alighted, so it actually does need to copy or move. Um, in the absence of the rule we just talked about on the previous slide, if I ask someone like, is it gonna copy or move? The, the answer I would expect to get is the wrong answer, which is going to copy because you'd look at the expression you say W is an L value and we know that we're not allowed to move out of L value expressions. Uh, but the reason why in this case it will move is because, because of the kind of special case rule on the previous slide, which says essentially we're returning a, a local object, W is a local variable of this function. Um, the first, the compiler is required to treat it as if it was an R value expression. It's not, but it treats it as if it was one. And if it was one, what it would do is it would try to move. So in this case, the W is gonna be propagate it back to the caller by a move operation instead of a copy. Assuming that it's not elided in the first place, but if it's not elided in the first place, then there's not really any issue to discuss here. Then if we look at the uh, second function here, this one's a little bit more tricky um, because when you look, if you read the comments that go along with this example down here, your immediate reaction might be, what the heck is going on here? Well, at least if you skip this first line and just read the second one. Uh, which says that copy elision is required. You might, your immediate, immediate reaction might be, well, what's going on here? This is not a pure R value expression here, S. This is an L value because it's a named object. But the thing is, the, the thing that, that would be getting missed in this case, which is kind of a subtle point, which is that the, re the return type of this function is widget. The return type, or the type of the thing that's being returned is not a widget. It's something completely different. It's a string, because S is a stood string. So although you're writing return s, you're not actually returning s. What you're returning is a temporary object that's been converted into a string, and then you're returning that temporary object. So effectively, even though you're writing return s, really what the compiler sees is it doesn't see return s. It sees return a widget that's constructed by using s. In other words, there's an implicit conversion that's being applied here to convert from a string into a widget. So when we say that copulation is required here, it's not that we're avoiding the copying of the s. 
because the S is not what's being returned. What we're avoiding the copy of is this temporary widget that's being created using S as the constructor parameter to create the widget. This temporary object is not being copied. Anyway, so this one here, there's not the issue of whether we're copying versus moving because we're required, that we're required to align the copy altogether. Um, anyway, but I just wanted to throw this in here because sometimes this sort of situation can arise where the thing that you're returning is actually a different type and you're using some kind of conversion. And that's always something you want to look out for. Otherwise, maybe your conclusion about what's going on could be very badly wrong. Because uh, maybe you didn't intend for this to happen. Like maybe this should have been a widget, but for some reason you made it a string and now you're, you're, you know, the code's doing something weird that you didn't expect as a result. Anyway, any questions? Okay, and then I, I think I already kind of covered this in earlier discussions, maybe based on some questions that came up. But again, this is basically just mentioning that again, like don't just start plastering student move all over the place in your code when you want to move, like even if it's not incorrect to move, because if you use stood move, basically what you're kind of saying is thou shalt move compiler. I don't care what you would otherwise do, I want you to move. The reason why this is a bad idea is what happens if the compiler would have elided the copy? Um, like maybe it's required, like you basically have a situation where the copy copulation is mandatory, so you know it's not going to copy or move, but then you throw in a stood move. Well, now you've just gone from it's not going to do anything to now you're forcing it to move, like very reluctantly the compiler is saying, I really don't want to do anything, but you're telling me I have no choice, I need to move, and then it will move. Um, so in most situ like in situations where you see like return stood move of something, in a lot of cases this will be like the, something you want to look at more carefully and make sure that it really, without the stood move, would actually copy or move, and it would specifically do a copy, which is not what you want. Um, anyway, there are some legitimate use cases, like for example here, maybe you have a, a function that reads a buffer, and it, you're passing the buffer in, some kind of buffer type, and you're passing it in as a R value reference. So this, basically you're passing it in by, by moving from it, for example, you, the actual parameter that's being passed in maybe as a std move, the actual argument. And then because buffer is actually a Actually, because buffer is the type of buffer is a R value reference to buffer, and the return type is buffer, they don't match. Uh, like, um, you can't do copy elision here because the return type and the thing that you're returning don't match, right? One is an R value reference to buffer, the other is buffer. These are not the same type. If you add like reference into something, it's not the same type. So because of this, it, you can't do copy elision. So you're either copying or moving. And then if, if we ask which is going to happen, it actually turns out it would have copied. So in this case, it, we might want to put a move in. But this is the only circumstance where, where you would in, introduce stood move into your code is you know that it's going to copy or you know it's basically going to copy and you don't want and you know it's safe to move so you add this to force it to happen. But you want to be careful that you don't add it in situations where it wouldn't have done anything at all. So, and I guess the last thing I wanted to do with respect to this topic before we can breathe a sigh of relief and kind of move on to a little bit less horrible things. Um, it's just to go through, walk through an example here that kind of put everything together in one place, all the different things that we've talked about. So here I have a, just to make things a little bit less monotonous, we have gadgets instead of widgets. And this particular type, it has like copy and move constructors and copy and move assignment operators. So like moving and copying is fully defined for this type. And then we have some functions which are using this type. We have a func1 and func2, which are both returning by value and they're returning gadgets. And then we have func3, which is passing by value, and it's passing gadgets. And then we have a bunch of code down below that's making various calls that are using some of these functions and so on. So I'm just going to kind of walk through them and, and basically maybe solicit some input along the way to at least some extent from you guys to see if you have some ideas about what's going to happen. So in the case of the first line here, um, is copy elision a possibility? Or like, is it maybe going to happen, definitely going to happen? Or like definitely not going to happen. Any any thoughts? Uh, what type of expression is gadget bracket bracket? The, the initializer for s, the thing we're initializing it to. What type of expression? L value, R value. If it's an R value, is it a pure R value or X value? Pure R. Yeah, yeah it's a pure R value, right? So if we're initial, we're doing initialization here, right? So thinking back to the various topics we covered, we're doing initialization. And the initializer, the thing we're initializing from, is a pure R value. There's a, there's a rule that that's, says something about that. Copy elided? Yeah, we're, the compiler is required to elide the copy. So what's going to happen is this default constructed gadget 
It's going to be deep, it's going to be constructed right into S. There's not going to be any copy or move. Just S is going to the value of the default constructed widget or sorry gadget. I keep saying widget now because everything's in widgets up to this point. Now we have gadgets. So the default constructed gadget will just materialize in S. It gets constructed directly in S. Um, how about this next line here? So here we're trying to create a gadget T uh, using std move of S. But what's going to well, is, can we align any copy or move here? Or maybe looking at another way, in order to align the copy, if it, we were able to align the copy, what would be required to align the copy? Yeah, and this is not a PR value, right? The std move is kind of an easy thing to remember. Like, there's not too many things that are X values, like in practice, you don't really encounter them too much. Stood move is like the most common case where we see stood move, think X value. Like that, that's kind of the reason that it exists is to, to create X values out of thin air or, or things that wouldn't have been X values. It kind of basically converts them into X values. Um, so this is, is essentially what's gonna happen here. You'll just use a move operation to propagate S into T. So after this line executes, the value of S is now into some mangled state. Some valid state, but it's mangled. You don't really know exactly what it is. Um, Next line here, we have u, it's being initialized by the return value of func, so let func1. So if we look at func1, uh, func1, let's first of all kind of deal just with func1 in isolation. So the question becomes when we're propagating the return value out of func1, so it's basically returning a gadget, um, can that propagating be elided? In other words, the copy or move that we're using to propagate the return value out of the function, can it be elided? And, and if it can, like, is it required to be elided? If it needed, if it was required to be elided, what would be necessary for that to be the case? Or maybe I can even back up a step. Um, is copy elision, what, what would be required if we want copy elision to be allowed at all? If it's, if we need, what, what are some of the things that need to be necessary, need to be uh, satisfied by the function? Um, well, you're, you're kind of getting a bit of a step ahead. Like that's if, if it's guaranteed to be elided is what you're looking at. But in order for it to be allowable at all, there's kind of a little bit more relaxed conditions. It doesn't necessarily have to be that. Mm -hmm. um, there's CV unqualified types that need to match, but like, uh, well, maybe I'll just kind of fill in the blank here. There's, there's kind of various bits and pieces, but they're not, not quite right, so at least so far. Um, what we need to have, the, well, the thing that we're, the thing that we're returning needs to be like a local variable. You can kind of imagine if it was a global variable, we have a problem if we move out of it because lots of people could observe that that value has changed, right? So that's why it's important it's local. I mean, a lot of these things, like once you kind of get more used to dealing with this and think about it more, it kind of makes sense. The rules are the way they are. This is why it needs to be local if you're going to elide the copy because if it's global, other people can see it. And if you mangle it, well, like the whole code base can see that you've mangled it and probably bad things will happen. So it needs to be local. Well, it's a local temporary object or like placeholder for a temporary object is being returned. Another thing that has to be true is the return type uh, of the function, which is gadget, has to up to CV qualifiers. In other words, you're allowed to ignore cons, you're allowed to ignore volatile. But other than these things, the type of the return expression has to match the type of the return function. So in this case, they match exactly. We're returning a gadget. The return type of the function is a gadget. So we're good to go. Basically, the conditions that are needed for copulation to be allowed are, are satisfied. Then the question becomes, are we required to do it? And then this comes back to the, the comment someone made over there about it, the gadget bracket bracket is a pure R value expression. So because of the pure R value expression, not only are we allowed to do copulation, we're actually required to do it in this particular case. And then if we go to go to func2, because I'll maybe kind of look at each one of these functions first and then go back down to the code below once we know a little bit more about these functions. Uh, func2 in this particular case, um, well, maybe I could just say, like, in this particular case, the, it, the code is, like, very similar sort of functionally, like, we're default constructing a gadget and returning it. Uh, but the difference is here the return statement is an L value. So the fundamental difference between func2 and func1, in the case of func2, it also satisfies the conditions that allow copy elision to be used. So we could elide the copy. However, what's different here is we're not required to elide the copy because of the fact this is not a pure R value expression. But otherwise, the, func the functions are more or less identical. Like they have similar functional behavior, they do kind of the same thing, they're returning a default constructed gadget. But the difference is like if you have a choice to write the function either this way or this way, because they basically kind of do the same thing in the end, more or less, um, it's just that one of them is guaranteed, well, maybe more efficient, because this one will never result in a copy to pro propagate the return value out of the function to the caller. 
Um, whereas this one, it may or may not, depending on how the optimizer chooses to do things. Yeah. And then this last function here is relevant because here we're passing gadgets by value. I think I'll stop here and go through the rest of the example in the next lecture. Um, but the reason, you, you might want to maybe go through this as an exercise, because like I, I know I realize it's hard if I'm just asking you kind of on the fly, like what's the answer. But I think it'd be a very useful exercise if you try to walk through this on your own, maybe just write down, scribble on a piece of paper what you think happens in each case. This, this one doesn't actually have the answers. And actually, I think this might be a new example that I need to put on a course website. There's one slide I added to this. I think this was it. Um, actually, I'll add it and announce it. And then what I would recommend is try going through this before the next lecture on your own. And then you can kind of compare notes to what, what we did in the lecture. Um, I think that'd be very helpful because this is, is like quite tricky stuff, but it's important to be able to do.